Syria, also known as Sham, has been gripped by a disastrous humanitarian crisis since the beginning of an uprising which sought political change in early 2011. With more than 4 million Syrians in need, the ongoing conflict has seen the internal displacement of some 3 million people with another 1 million becoming refugees in neighbouring countries such as Turkey, Jordan, Iraq and Lebanon. This figure is likely to treble over the next year to 3 million refugees. Furthermore, the death toll is increasing, claiming the lives of more than 70,000 people. There seems to be no let-up in the conflict, which is having the greatest impact on the weakest and most vulnerable, women and children. Is on the ground inside Syria, responding to the crisis. My name is Saeed Ali, and with Suleiman McPherson, we are part of a team overseeing the delivery of emergency aid. And this is our journey. Uh, we're here at um, Hatay uh, International Airport for our Syria campaign. Uh, in the coming days, inshallah, we'll be delivering some vital aid to the Syrian uh, population inside Syria. We'll be supplying uh, packets such as food packets and, and baby packets. And this is a follow-up from our campaign that we've been uh, running in London. So all donations that we've collected over the past month, uh, we're going to implement the aid from these donations. As of March 2013, there are more than 230,000 registered Syrian refugees in Turkey, with a further 200,000 living in urban areas. In order to find out more about their conditions, we visit nearby Syrian schools and hospitals. There is a huge strain on a very poor infrastructure of schools set up by Syrian refugees to meet the specific needs of their community. With only a few makeshift schools in operation, thousands of Syrian children find themselves in long waiting lists. The schools are understaffed, poorly equipped and overcrowded. And this, more so evident in our visit to the Salam school, set up by Syrians from Canada. It is hard to predict the long-term impact that the lack of education will have on these children. But the need for them to receive education in a safe environment is now more important. Places like the Salam School, which cater for more than 900 pupils, act as an important centre, allowing them to learn and play with other children and to take respite from their horrific memories. But even so, some memories are hard to forget having come across their drawings depicting the war back home. Looking into these bright, innocent young faces, we see resilience and strength as they sing their nasheeds of hope. Um, right now we're in a hospital um, which is on the border of Syria. Um, the hospital treats up to 500 patients a day, uh, Syrian patients, uh, majority of them being women and children. Many Syrians caught up in the conflict are having to cross the border into Turkey seeking medical treatment, often ending up in makeshift hospitals that have been set up by doctors and nurses who have also fled the war. 18-year-old Khadija, a mother of two, is one of them. Injured by shrapnel from a missile which landed near her home in Hama, Syria, she is now wheelchair bound. Another patient, 17 year old Mahmoud Hisni from Idlib, tells us how he was abruptly woken up in the middle of the night by the noise of government helicopters firing into his neighborhood.
والحمد لله عملت خمس عمليات في بطني ان شاء الله كله في سبيل الله It's day two and our journey takes us inside Syria. Our first stop is an abandoned school which operates a shelter for families fleeing the conflict. Um, there are roughly about 16 uh, families uh, living in this school. Uh, most of them have, have fled the war uh, deep inside Syria and have come here. Uh, we've spoken to, to the children and they've described uh, their lives before. Uh, they described the horrors that they've witnessed in, in uh, the, the cities that they've come from. According to the UN, 70% of the people affected by this crisis are women and children under the age of 17. Having met many of these young people, all they speak of are the harrowing tales of their experiences. This is a common story shared by almost all the people we meet, stories of shelling and daily attacks. <laughs> يعني القصف فراج ما صواريخ طيارات يعني المروحية ما ما بتغيب عشر دقائق ترجع كل يعني قصف رهيب ما في منه كل سوريا مريم's story is no different. She is now living in a container with her five daughters and grandchildren. تفضلي. أنا مغاني من منطقة حما ورجلي قوس وهو قاعد على الكرسي. Some of the displaced people are forced to rent expensive rooms in urban areas, often sharing with other families. This man, whose identity we cannot reveal, explains some of the conditions they live in. The majority of those displaced are in camps such as the Karama camp, where more than 30,000 people live in difficult and squalid conditions. Mr. Osama, one of the leaders of the camp, is our guide. In this camp, roughly about 5,000 families reside here uh, in poor conditions. Uh, we were currently given a tour by the uh, person responsible, uh, Mr. Osama Hajj, uh, and he's told us some of the problems that uh, the residents here and the internally displaced people here are facing. Uh, some of those problems include um, the hygiene, uh, we have open sewers in some places, uh, where the, toilet dis the toilets here, although few, are far from the, uh, where most of the people are. Ten families arrive at this camp every day, uh, there are roughly 570 tents in this camp and um, they share between themselves uh, one water facility, uh, one water well. But he also explained to us that in some camps uh, there are no uh, water wells at all. So uh, they're actually privileged, although <laughs> you know the situation here is very dire. Hada Uqtuk? Is Maki? Zainab. Kam Uruk Zainab? Nashar. Okay. We're in one of the tents here in this camp and um, this is uh, Zainab and Sindis. Um, she's just explained to us that 10 of them live in this tent. Uh, you can see how confined the space is. They cook here, they eat here and they sleep here. Over the past two days, we have reported on the many situations of hardship that Syrians are facing. It's now day three of our journey, distribution day, the main reason why we are here. 
The team's up early and at the warehouse, getting ready to load our emergency packs. We distribute a number of aid packages within the camps. Um, unfortunately, due to the numbers that are living within the camps, we're not able to reach every single person. Uh, we hope to return and to continue the distribution uh, in the future, in the near future. Many different packs were given out. We have food packages that contain a number of food items, including rice, including pasta. And we also distribute a number of packages uh, that are for mothers who have children with nappies, baby wipes, baby cream uh, and shampoo. Um, but help is obviously needed to continue uh, to provide and supply aid to these people within the camps. I mean, the people that we've visited today, um, they've all come, they've all have different backgrounds. They've to help, they all have different stories to, to tell. Uh, some of them were doctors, some of them were uh, teachers, uh, some of them worked in uh, administration. Um, they've had different backgrounds and they have to endure uh, the situation that they're living in now. And the main idea of our project say, is to give them some dignity and, you know, just return some dignity to their lives and give them hope. And uh, I think we have done that today. We brought some smiles back to the children. We've brought some smiles back to the parents, and, you know. And uh, we hope we could continue doing this uh, in the future. Raising one million US dollars, or 600,000 pounds, for its Syria campaign. Based on our findings from Syrians on the ground, our programs tackle three important areas. We are providing food, with our main focus on flour for bread and nutritional packs for babies alongside traditional family essentials. We are also installing hygiene facilities for camps, such as toilets and shower units, to maintain people's basic needs and dignity, as well as reducing the possible outbreak of disease. Finally, we want to support the many children that are missing out on their daily education by providing more opportunities to learn and therefore secure the future of young Syrians. On this short journey, we've encountered many people in desperate situations, but we have come to recognize their courage and bravery above all. It is important that these dignified people are not forgotten and that their stories act as a reminder for our action. With our journey coming to an end, the work still continues. And with your help, Al Muntada Trust will continue to provide emergency assistance to those in need inside Syria.